So it's a great pleasure to be here, and I hope I will keep you up after the, the good lunch that, that we just had. Um, first, the context. So <coughs> this, the work I will present is in the context of uh, uh, my ERC advanced grant project, which is basically targeted to understand the, the burst flights. So to really understand how to model the fluid dynamics, couple the PDEs, with can be compressible, incompressible, with the deformating, deformation of the wings, so you have boundaries which are actually moving in the fluids and, uh, and all these things have actually been addressed to a big extent in this uh, publication uh, in a completely general case. So with n-dimensional case, energy consistent, geometric, coordinate free, you know, the keywords you see there. But the next step is of course to do, to do numerics and that is actually when Andrea came into the team to, to really address this issue. And I will talk about, uh, about this. So I have a, I'm very happy I have this team, Andrea is there, is only pre is present, and many of the things I've been doing uh, on the theoretical side is actually involving Federico and, and, and Rami. And the other guys are working uh, more on the practical side of the, of the project. I love geometry, and I think that if I don't see the geometry, I don't understand things. And this, you may know this, this is actually a painting of Raffaello, and this is the Academia. Okay, you know, Academia was founded by Plato in 387 before Christ. This is Aristotle and this is Plato. And on the entrance of the Academia there was written this, let no one ignorant geometry enter. So this is a good place for mathematics and so I thought to, to mention this. So uh, everything that we've been working on, uh, we've been using actually um, differential form because that's a very nice way to express geometry and in a coordinate invariant way. And you, you are most of you are mathematicians, so you do know about this, but what differential form are basically are uh, uh, fields, you know, are def uh, depending on the position and time in general, and are actually uh, multilinear operators that go to a scalar, uh, they return a scalar value. And it actually turns out, I don't have the time to talk about it, if you have a question during the week I can answer, it turns out that actually in mechanics, if you want to talk about deformation, you need tensor valued forms. And that's something because which popped up, which was uh, an insight we, we got. And what are forms? Are basically things that you can pair with the manifold. So one form you pair with the one-dimensional some manifold and you return the real number. So it's really a pairing between a, a space and the form is an intrinsic pairing. So one form integrate on line, two form integrate on surface, three form integrate on volumes. And F3 operation, which is the wedge. So you have a K form and an L form. You have a K plus L forms. You have a, 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 a a topological operator, which is the D, where the, st uh, the uh, Stokes theorem comes from, which basically increases the value of one. And then you have the last operator, which is the metric operator. There's actually the old talk would go around how to get rid of these guys, so to speak, in the discrete case, for the reason I tell you before. But it's the one that basically gives you the Hilbert structure, the inner product in, in this kind of setting. Okay, so I will talk about the problem first then a, a formulation of the canonical case, and we're actually working on a, on a fluid dynamics case right now, so a nonlinear case, so this is all linear, what I present would be all linear. Go to a quick form, a formulation and, and give you a glimpse of discretization. All the, the details are, are in the paper which is now under submission, which were presented before. So I will start first with the problem. So in physics, as I said, uh, we, we use these forms I just introduced. So, uh, and suppose you have a K form and, and uh, it will leave actually in, uh, you, need, you need to take the D of this form. So from a functional uh, point of view, you need to actually also to, to belong this uh, to the fact that also the, the differential is properly defined so that the space in which it lives. And when you want to discretize these things, you have a process which calls reduction, which basically can nicely represent this in, in co-chains. Okay, and this uh, would be basically the discretization process that you have in this reduction. And then you can do the interpolation and go again to uh, a, a continuous space, if you wish, which is the, the, where you have the projected physics. So basically you could see it as uh, if you combine these two operations, reduction and interpolation, is actually, uh, uh, this is indicated as pi, it's basically a projection of this subspace, which is the subspace which is spanned by the functions of your approximation. And the error you commit is the error that you do in your numerics, basically. Now, uh, the nice thing is that in this way of doing, if you use phi, for example, of, uh, as introduced by Arnold, you have preservation, what is called, you have a cochain property. So you have the preservation of the property and, the, and a commutation between the D operator, which is the topological operator, and this projection. So you, you preserve the topology of your problem. And so it's structure preserving. 
And if you use Whitney forms, which is a special case, a lower order case of, um, in the fixed settings, then you also actually preserve separately the reduction and the interpolation, which is called a conforming operator. The problem is uh, that, as I said, the, this is basically this, the odd star is the metric structure of space, which, which uh, is, is this, uh, the, the geometry, but is also the physics, like you know, in a, a mag magnet electromagnetics, for example, the uh, permittivity uh, and, and all the, the contents that is related to the, the metric of space. And if you do reduction, what you have is the problem that you always need to go, as I said, showed in the beginning, if you have a k-form and you have the odds, you get to normally in the continuous set to the nm n minus k form. But if you then do the reduction of these two forms, they actually live in different spaces. And this is a problem because uh, for, for two reasons. Because uh, you, you have dual meshes, so you have here you would have to mesh this in a certain space, and this should have, uh, be living in a different mesh. But even more important, if you want to do interconnection, you have a boundary, which is you have virtual points that get out of the boundary. So if you have two different dual meshes, it's not what you want to have if you want to talk about interconnection, which is what we want to do in portable audiences. So this is a problem. So how can we tackle this? The main idea is actually very simple. Suppose you have an equation like this, in which you have an appearance of a notch of the omega. What you want is, you define basically a, 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 a omega bar, and you say, okay, that's my odds of omega. And then what you do, you, have a, you define a primary system, and you define a dual system. And in that way, if you consider these two systems at the same time, you basically have a redundant representation, then what you have is that you have one instantialization in continuous time, and then use each other states in a crossed way, and then you can basically integrate the two systems. In this way, you will never have to use the odds product, the odds uh, operator, and therefore you will not make mistakes in the discretization due to this problem. So let me try to understand, let me show you how this works in, in details. But this is the core idea I will talk about. So suppose you have a canonical port of control Amistonia system, in which you have, uh, uh, you know, this is a canonical form with uh, the DD operator. And then you would have the flows would be, uh, these would be the flows, and this would be the effort as defined here. Okay, <clears throat> and oops, I, I went too fast. And then you see that if you take the uh, uh, here the uh, uh, the variational derivative of this Hamiltonian, which is quadratic, it's a linear system in this case. Then you were, here you would appear the odds Q and the HP. I used two odds Q and P because specifically in the energy, this odds in this representation is different than the paper, by the way. But in this representation, this would have for example, the, 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 the electrical and magnetic permittivity in the metric itself, which I think is, in my opinion, is, is more elegant. So what you do in dual fields? So what you do is this. You define, as I said, uh, uh, this uh, odds of Q and the odds of P, and you see, as I indicated, if this is a K form, this will be an N minus K form. That's the operator that the odds does, as I indicated before. So what you can first start off with, you, you take the odds of this equation. If you take the odds of this equation, uh, uh, you see that uh, an odds appear with respect to this equation, both on the left side here and here, on all, the, all, the, all parts of the equations. And then once you have that, you basically can introduce a odds odds, uh, which turns out to be uh, this identity indicated here. Is basically, if you take the odds odds of a form, you get the same form plus a minus or a plus depending on the dimensions of things. So I put a bullet, not to make uh, exponents with, uh, which would be mis mistakes anyhow, so that the bullet indicates something that you should calculate. Then you see that <coughs> these two odd odds is an identity, so I put it in. And then once you have this, then uh, I actually can get one of these odds. You see now you are left with uh, here. Uh, you have two odds in here, you have one odds, because then, you see, I kind of let this appear on this side, which is a new energy function, a new Hamiltonian, which is the co-energy, which is the co-energy of the dual variables. Okay? So you, say, you have here then, uh, uh, in these steps, you basically have a primary system, uh, and you have a, a, a dual system, and uh, you see the energy is here, uh, what I would call co-energy. So you have the energy and the co-energy. Okay? And these are the two representations of the two systems. Now, uh, 
Now I've substituted the, the values here. And you see now immediately that you have here the state, here q, q dot bar, p dot bar, p bar dot. And these are the original ones. But of course, these, by construction in this case, will be obviously the states of the other system. So they are kind of coupled, these two systems. OK. Now, so let, let's analyze this a bit more in detail. So these are the two systems. So if we put them beside each other, OK, then uh, uh, you can immediately observe that if you cross, you take some equation from one side, some equation on the other side, you see that here you get an operator which you have a d and co d. So I define the co d here uh, basically as the odd d odd, OK, in a proper way. And then you see that here you have an equation which you have a q, uh, q, and you have p bar, OK, on the left side. And you have on the right side, you have q bar and p. So I cross the two systems, OK? And the nice thing, which is, I think is kind of interesting, which of course has to do with the, what is usually done in Lagrange transformation, is that if you define then the total energy, oh, is my pointer here? Yeah. If you define the total energy here, as the, uh, the, which is of course function of q, p, q bar, p bar, as the sum of the energy and the co-energy, then you see that basically the odds disappear from the energy. Okay, so the energy, you can express the energy without any metric information. This is kind of interesting. Okay, it will not be fundamental for what I see, but it's something interesting, something we are working further in, in the moment. Now, furthermore, you have uh, the boundaries, and also you see I cross the boundary as well, and you have this kind of two separate systems, which are the crossing of the two systems I started off with. Now, then uh, we take these two systems. OK, these are the, uh, are the boundary uh, conditions. And then uh, we can start from this system to look at the quick formulation, because we want to go uh, to the numeric situation. So if you have these two systems, and now I indicate in notation the, the, the comma, you know, the, the, the bracketing here with the comma is the inner product, which is indicated like that. So it's the integral on the volume on, on the domain you're using, which can be boundary or the volume itself of the wedge of alpha and star, uh, uh, beta. And if I write a bar here, I just take the wedge. OK, so this is the inner product, what you use for Euler structure. And this is the dual product, the intrinsic dual product, which does not need any metric structure in order to be defined. OK, so if I now start and I multiply, I use here proper dimensions for test function. You see, I take the VK in this case with the inner product. OK, so I have to VK and Q dot, I take the first equations. Uh, OK, you get this, this equation here. And if I do the same for the other equations, you see I take now, the, this one is a K minus 1 form. So I need to use a, a K minus 1 form as a test uh, form. And I do a, a bit of calculation. This pops up. With, and then if you use the integration by part on these terms, it turns out, of course, the boundary up here with the trace here. And if you substitute it, you get this equation. Okay? So, I mean, the steps are trivial. But the point is, of course, that this is, is, a, is a, here I used integration by part, and here I didn't. Well, I do the same on the other side, and you get also two equations, the green one and the orange one from the right, and green one and orange one from the left. Now, um, of course, with the, with the two uh, uh, um, uh, boundary conditions. If I now take these two systems, OK, so um, with a, with a, it's important to know that these are the same boundary conditions, you see? The f here is the same as the, on the left side. And you see, by definition, if you take the odds of the q, the odds of the q with this, you, you turn the, the green one. So these are exactly the same boundary condition of the two systems, obviously. So you have these two systems, which seems almost independent, but you have these two terms, which are kind of coupling. So is, is there this coupling from Q and Q bar? So this is something which is still couples the two systems. So what you can then do is you say, OK, wait a minute. I, can't, I want to write this uh, uh, dual product as an as a, as a, um, uh, inner product. OK, and I do it on the both on the right and the left side. And if I substitute it there, it's, it's uh, the colors, you cannot see it properly. But if you substitute it 
in, in that location, eventually you get to these equations. And this is interesting because now if you look what's going on here, what you have is the following. That you have this, this system is completely independent except this variable here, which can be chosen as an input if you will discretize the equations. And the funny thing is that you could choose the boundary. You want this as an input, you would put it here, just right there. But if you would like this as, a, as an output, eh, which would appear uh, on, the, on the dual system, in order to get rid of that, you could choose as a testing form, a form which is homogeneous and would basically cancel that input because that terms then, if it's homogeneous, it means that the, on the trace it would be zero, so that terms then would not count and the terms will disappear. And in this way you can handle the strong or, or a weak condition on, on the boundaries. Now, I will not have the time to go into the detail of the discretization, but just want to give you how this step will be done uh, uh, if, you, if you start from there. Then you can make the following step. If you have the basis function, and this could be using all the basis function for FIC that uh, I, I mentioned before, uh, you would have this uh, uh, would be your basis function, this would be your, your, your numerical representation in your basis function. Okay. So you could then, for example, everything which you have seen in the previous, in the previous uh, um, slide, you, if you have this inner product, would pop up as a term of this form, in which the m would basically be the various you know, uh, inner product of the basis function in which you are using, which I indicated there. Then you can define a dual product, you get something similar, in which, uh, uh, due to the skew symmetry, you would have this property, which depends, of course, on, on the forms uh, that you are using. If V and U are K and N minus K form, this property then would satisfy, would pop up in, in, in a numerics. Then you would have the exterior derivative, eh, would also appear something like that. Um, and, uh, and the trace would be a, a kind of projection on, on the parts that are, are part, part of the trace of, of, of that form. And the important thing is the odge is not needed because if you would have used the odge, the odge would basically pop up as a projection in your numerics and will create an error. Okay? But in this way, you have seen in the equation I show you, there is no odge anywhere. Okay? So we completely got rid of the odge and that exactly was the goal that we wanted to, to, to achieve. So, we have no problem with, uh, with dual meshes. You can use in both systems, you choose the same mesh, so it's perfect for interconnection because you don't have fictitious points outside those meshes. No problem with points outside the boundary, as I said. Uh, no error due to projection because the edge is not used, the discrete edge. And there is no loss of geometry thanks to this, this dual field. So, as an example, how would that work? This is the system you had on the left side, the primary system I came up uh, on, on the previous two slides. So you could see that by using the steps I just introduced, this would be the, the step you would have. Okay, so you have, uh, uh, here would, you would get, for example, the, the M, here you would get the D, and then you could see that this is minus DT, this is actually what, what was presented by, uh, in the, uh, just before the lunch. Um, and then, by considering that this should be true for any of the testing function, you get rid of the testing function and you will get to the, let's say, the, the finite element, the numeric representation of this equation. I could do this, for, 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 uh, of course, for the dual system as well. These are some uh, simulations that Andrea has been doing. And you see, these are the simulation of the primary and the dual system on, uh, on, uh, uh, for Maxwell equation and for the waves, and you see that, in fact, the left and the right system are exactly doing the same thing. Okay? And, and this, of course, is a linear case, but we are looking how to extend this into the nonlinear case. So this draw me, uh, drives to, to my conclusions. I had much more time, but I was afraid to, so but there will be more time for questions. So, um, so the dual field approach allows to use a single mesh. I think this is the core, this is the reason why we started looking at this. Because, and, and, and this is, is very useful because you will want, and actually this is something we're looking right now, because one thing I want to see is if you consider these two meshes and you consider, for example, the interconnection of two systems, 
And one of the system is a, is a single tetradium, for example, just a, a single element, so to speak. I think that thanks to the fact that you connect the two systems, you can define ports which have the same dimension. One thing which is known in these kind of things is that if you have a, a k form and an n minus k form, you have, you know, you have a, a 3 and n minus 3. Or, or, you, know, you, you have a kind of dimension incompatibility in the discrete case. By, by using the dual system, you basically symmetrize the whole system. You have a redundant system, but in which then the efforts and the flow in the discrete have the same dimension, because it's always the n. And so I think that this gives, especially, you will have them uh, constraints, so very likely will all pop up in algebra differential equation. But it's very nice, I think, from a system theoretic point of view, because it gives the possibility to look at the system as a discretization, as the interconnection of port and Newtonian systems, at the, at the, at the, as final element port and Newtonian system, to interpret the discretization, the interconnection of finite port and Newtonian systems. Um, you don't need any fictitious points, and this, of course, this, uh, is, is fundamental for proper interconnection. Uh, and also, uh, uh, this satisfied, of course, in the old constructed energy, the, 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 the power balance that you had started off with. I didn't talk about it, but because I only talked about the discretization space, but discretization in time, there has been working on, uh, use the gauss legendre collocation method, to have a symplectic way to integrate the equation, which is something that was also presented um, uh, in uh, Chimse uh, by, by some, other, some other people. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have a question, and it's for question and discussion. So you can ask, do not hesitate. He, he, was, he was so, he says, you have to be on time, you have to be on time. He scared me, you know. <laughs> so first question. So, uh, well, the pace of, of the talk was very fast. I couldn't follow. Now, I can't do it in another time. That's uh, <laughs> so now, your method should be applicable to, say, second order scalar elliptic problems. This is the simplest case. This is this. Uh, hyperbolic. Hyperbolic. Okay, then scalar wave equation. Yes, sure. A scalar wave equation. Can you write down on the blackboard what are the unknowns that you use for your method for the discretization of the scalar wave equation, the spatial unknowns? Where they are located and what kind of finite element spaces are used? If you were right to write the wave equation, if you have it actually it's interesting, because if you look at these two systems, let me go back and let me show you that specifically. Um, I lost my mouse. Oh, here it is. If you look at uh, this, I don't see anything without glasses. Yes, this one. If you look at this these two systems, which is the primary and the, se uh, the dual system, okay, so you, you would have, um, you see this, you have this matrix and you have this matrix here. So one, the P is the gradient, one is the divergence? No, I, I, I D, D is a, a, a stereo derivative, which is all the operations that you have. No, no, I would like to discuss really the scalar wave equation, then this yeah. is a concrete meaning, 3D Euclidean. Yes, degree. yes, so if you, if you have this, so I, I don't, I, you know, gradient and divergence is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit allergic to that, to that terminology because it hides the geometry. But what you basically could show that if you have, suppose that you call this 0D uh, minus 1 RD, you call, excuse me, 0D, you call this operator D, okay? And you call this other D the other one. Uh -huh. So this is the adjoint. That's the adjoint, OK? Now, you could show that if you then take, if I remember right, so if you take, for example, the first system, you take the time derivative of the first system, OK? 
what you have, you would have uh, Q double dot, I will leave the indices P uh, double dot, uh, would get uh, D, um, then you get D Q bar uh, P bar uh, dot, right? And then you substitute the other term, okay? Then you would get, where is the, 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 the eraser? So you get D star, uh, QP. QP. This is the diagonal operator with the this Laplacian. Laplacian. So these are, here you have the two Laplacians, mm -hmm. and then you have the wave equation. Of this field and this field, basically. And you can do the opposite as well. All right. So, in fact, you, use a, you pull apart the two equations by factorizing the Laplace. Yeah. Or the, or the Laplace. I'm not correct because this is not the Laplacian, correctly speaking. This is not yet the Laplacian. Eh? If you want to be general for any dimension, because this is only d rho, but the Laplacian, the, the Laplace Bertrand operator is d rho plus rho d. You can easily write it out and you get, you can show that it's, it's still correct. You have to use some odd matrices mm -hmm. in between and you can define it properly. And then you have the wave equation in a general case for any dimensional field. And this is nice because you see it immediately from the construction of this 2D and this star. Okay, now it's much clearer. Thank you. Okay, and, and, and this is, in the, what I think is nice in this kind of systems is that you see this is um, in a port Hamiltonian system, this is a, you can write basically any linear system more or less uh, in this way. In the case, for example, if you have Navier-Stokes, things get more complicated because you have a term which is actually an advection of the vorticity which pops up. But the nice thing is then that what we're working now, that the advection of the vorticity, you have basically uh, the velocity of the flow and the vorticity. But the vorticity is on the second system, so you can couple the two systems again. So I think this is really a way to, to solve a lot of this stuff. Okay, next question. Okay, I, I have one waiting for orders. So uh, between the, the, the primal and dual systems, the, are there power exchanges? Sorry, are you? Are, are there power exchanges, energy flowing from the primal to, to the dual, or? Well, if this is something that I, I actually, we still have to, to, to do in details, but what you actually have, normally, uh, what you actually have, you have, I'm writing bone graphs, I don't know if everybody knows bone graph, but this, if this is the, the total energy, eh, you basically have one bond here and one bond here, okay? And this is, the pri is where the, 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 the Q, Q, uh, QP and this is Q bar, P bar, okay? And then you represent this, so it's a dual representation here. You have basically here a, a dual structure and here you have a, a kind of dual dual structure, okay? But then you have here the same interconnection. So the boundary is the same, okay? The funny thing is that there is something very interesting going on here because you see that the two systems crossed. Mm -hmm. And that sounds very much to me like scattering representation. So I'm looking at, uh, at the moment how to interpret this in a scattering situation because I think the fact that really puzzles me is that if you write the, usually there's something very interesting that you have when you define energy and co-energy. You know, if you have, for example, you always, when, when, I, when I explain in classes what is energy and what is co-energy, right? And you say, okay, suppose that this is, uh, uh, this is momenta and this is velocity in a scalar case, right? And then you say, okay, then, uh, uh, you know, you have, uh, this is speed of light, so to speak, okay? So you, have, you would have a straight line and then something like that, okay? And then you say, well, this is energy, this error is energy, and this is co-energy, okay? So let's say energy and co-energy. Well, this is uh, not very interesting for, the, for kinetic energy, but if you go to flux and current, immediately you get a nonlinear difference between the energy and co-energy. The nice thing is that you see that this is a square, right? 
So you have the basically the, the sum of the energy, the cone energy, is P uh, times V. Okay, and uh, what I showed in the HT is the generalization of that in a completely general context. Because you have basically that the, the HT is equal to the energy plus the co-energy, okay, which turns out to be this uh, P wedge Q, which is the volume form for a general situation. And I think that is very interesting. Okay, but behind my question is also the idea that if you perform a structure preserving discretization yep. to the interconnected primal and, yep. and dual systems, then okay, you will preserve the structure of the they whole thing. They are independent. Thing. You can the, the, you, you take the, this hybrid system that I showed, the one which is uh, orange green yeah. and orange green are two independent systems. Yeah, but are you, you can sure use half of it? Yeah, but okay, are you sure you okay. will? You, you can get access to the energy of the primal systems alone, so to, to get, uh, for instance, I don't know, uh, energy preserved in the, in the primal system alone? Yes, not? but the point is that if you use half of this, so if you use the Q P bar, you will miss uh, uh, Q bar. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, you will miss P. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you want to have information on P, and you don't want, numerically speaking, make mistakes, eh? you should take it from the other side. And in that way, but in that way it's interesting because then you can conserve quantities, you know, you take it where you need them, so to speak. Yeah. Um, how do you consistently initialize the two, uh, the primal and the dual system? Like in a time integration, for example, at the beginning, at T0, you need to initialize yes. the two systems. I mean, you have, the, you have the, the, the fields. The fields are continuous fields that you want to simulate. And then you, 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 uh, uh, you can cal calculate of your fields, physical fields, not discretization. You take the odds and you have the two initialization. I mean, the initialization is you should not do it discrete and then you give it the other. You, you start from a physical problem, right? So you take the field and you take the odds in a, in a, in a continuous time. And then you initialize them on both sides. That's the way you should do it. Isn't it? You should not make the mistake, the error at the beginning and take it along. You should be, get rid of, of the error and then initialize the system and go along. And uh, Andrea, we were discussing, yes, he showed that, uh, I mean, the two systems are actually converging. So they converge to the same solution. And therefore, the two systems never diverge from, from each other, the discussion we had yesterday. OK, thank you. But I hear you, but they are recording it, so... Okay. okay, so maybe stupid question because I came in a bit late, but why do you call it biomimetic? No, not biomimetic, mimetic. Oh, I thought you said biomimetic. No, 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 not biomimetic. Call it mimetic because yeah, that you have, a, in exterior calculus, you have, a, you know, all these operations, yeah. and you would like to have the same kind of operator in the discrete case. There is something which is called discrete exterior calculus, eh? uh, and... <coughs> And for example, one of the problems which is known is that, you know, to, to discretize the odds is, is an issue because you did some, some funny, uh, uh, funny um, choices. Yeah, so I, I figured that maybe something with the bird, but... Not, uh, no, 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 no. I okay. we, we'll, we'll do it, the biomimetic one, we do it for the complete bird, yeah. But uh, at the end, you need to discretize the odds anyway because you want to recover the, the, the physical variables. No, no, that's the point. I don't need to discretize the odds at all. That's the whole point. Because you have, you have your PDEs expressed in exterior calculus in continuous time, okay? And you have your problem, and you, you initialize your problem and the dual, okay? That you do it in continuous time. So you have two fields which are dual. And then you initialize the numerics, and then you don't have to, to calculate the odds for the whole time. No, but you need it for initialization, I mean. Yeah, but that was related to the qu previous yeah. question. You do it in a continuous field, because then in that way you don't have an approximation. Yeah, and then if the, the arch is uh, time-independent, then it, it, yeah. it should be preserved for yeah. the rest of the discretization. Yeah. yeah okay. And uh, there is a lot, I think, to be, to be looking into how the two things involve, because it's, 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 I think there is a, something very deep 
on my opinion on on this way of approaching and what I indicated here and scattering variable that's something that uh, we're actually looking at the moment okay yeah. let me take a naive algebraic point of view you have an answer if I can answer because the numeric guy is, is there but I will do yeah. my best yeah so you have a a strange mismatch between dimensions or sizes or and you blow up the the dim dimension of to, two. two by two and then you have uh, something where the uh, the symmetries are apparent and then you do the numerics in such a way that the symmetry of the blown up system is properly reflected and the other part comes out by itself. Is that, is that the way I understand it? Yeah, it's, yeah by, by, by it's, it's like, you know, if you look at, think about mechanics, for example, you know, in mechanics you have a Lagrangian and a Hamiltonian way of doing stuff, yeah. right? And it's, it's kind of saying, you know what, uh, uh, why don't you do it, you take the tangent and the cotangent bundle at the same time, because in that way you don't have to, to, to go back and forth, and if you do the numerics, in that way, you, you, the approximation that intrinsically you have due to the fact that to, to go from left to right, you have some metric property. The metric is really the continuity of space. You see, you want to get rid of that because if you go to the discrete time, you get rid of it at the start and then you, you stay in something which doesn't use it. But if you have dissipation in your original formulation, how do you symmetrize? the dissipation term in a proper way. This is my, my worry. Well, dissipation would be a port, right? So would, you would bet, uh, I mean, this system is the purely conservative yes side. No, yeah. We have the boundary and you could put the dissipation at the boundary and there as well, you could, I think, discretize, I haven't think, thought about it yet, but I mean, you could discretize both sides and every time that in your dissipation, possibly it would appear, you just write it there. So it's, I don't see any problem there. Okay. Because it's just an, in a system you attach to that, uh, considering that the power interconnection is probably preserving, I don't see a problem there. Maybe I'm missing, but I think it should not be a problem. Thanks. Uh, maybe I can ask the next speaker to install his uh, slides on the computer. In between, maybe we can, we have time for a last question. Okay, we can keep it for the coffee break after, so let's take again the, the speaker. Thank you very much.